The topic that I want to talk about tonight, I mean, it's, it's, it's very appropriate for Ador. Did everybody hear me? <coughs> In many ways, it's a very difficult topic. Seems simple, but it's not. What's the topic? I want to talk about the nation called Amalek. Now we know about Amalek, we know from the Torah, that right after the Jews got out of Egypt, they were attacked by Amalek. And Yoshua went to war with them, and he almost destroyed them, but apparently God said, don't destroy them. Whatever. And um, <clears throat> so we know about Amalek, and um, uh, throughout the generations, Amalek, uh, we know Haman, who was an Amaleki, right? Uh, and he, of course, also tried to destroy the Jewish nation. But, you know, what's interesting about that is when <coughs> you look at the Torah, if not for the fact that the Torah had said that there was a nation called Amalek, and this nation of Amalek went to war with the Jews, I would never have believed it. The Torah says it, so I believe it. But I would never have believed it. Why? Because it's incredible. Let's take a look and why the concept of the fact that Amalek attacked the Jews is so highly improbable as to create an incredible astonishment that it even occurred. Let's take a look. First idea. The Medu said that Amalek crossed five boundaries to get to the Jewish people. There was no military threat of the Jews. The Jews didn't want to attack Amalek. They had across, Amalek had across five boundaries, which shows you that we're very, really very far away. So if they're not a military threat, can you tell me why they want to go to war with the Jewish people? Certainly not because they were afraid of being conquered. So therefore, we see that there's no military threat, so that lacks a motive. Usually countries go to war because it's a military threat. They want to be taken over by another country, right, or they want to be slaughtered, or whatever. Why go to war when there's no military threat? Oh, second of all, not only there was no military threat, there's no religious threat. What's a religious threat? People make a mistake. <clears throat> they think that Amalek were atheists, and they were annoyed at Jews because Jews were believers. So therefore, you know, they took up the banner of atheism to destroy the Jews. But that's wrong. There, is, there was no such thing as atheism. No such thing. Atheism, in many ways, is a modern-day invention. It comes as a result of Darwin and so on. But in those days, everybody believed in God. They believed in many gods. It's true. Polytheism. But there was no atheist then. I mean, took a look at Egypt. Egypt had, how many, they had a pantheon of gods. Every nation had gods. Uh, you know, by Bolok, Balpaor. Everybody worshipped some god, and so on. So, what was the problem here? Amalek believes in their gods, whatever that is, and the Jews believe in its God. That's all. So wh why are you going to war for this? There's no ideological or really in many ways a religious threat at all. Second very strange thing. Third strange thing. Do you know what it costs to mount a war? The United States slipped from the United States to Afghanistan you know what it cost them? It cost them one billion dollars a day to make a war in Afghanistan. Right? It's a fortune. So therefore, Amalek, you think about that, what are you doing? It, you know what it cost? It cost a fortune to make war against the Jews. And not only that, if you really want to think about it, what's even more strange, one of the most difficult parts of an enemy is the, what's called the supply line. You got to supply the troops with food and everything like that, you see. So usually what, what happens is the enemy, I mean the, the, the army that does it, it, they take all the property, you know, farms and all that, and they take all the food from the farmers. But what the problem was is what? It's a wilderness. You know, Midrach Sin, these are wildernesses. There's nobody to take the food from. Uh, therefore, they would have to supply, right, the army with an enormous amount of food <coughs> over an enormous distance. How could you do that? For what reason? Fourth question. 
Egypt is the greatest nation on earth, on the Ramses. Jews destroyed Egypt, or rather God did, but the Jews destroyed Egypt. Egypt is the greatest power on earth. If the Jews destroyed Egypt, it stands to reason that anybody who wants to war with the Jews is a suicide threat. That's what I would think. Suicide. If they destroyed Egypt, which is the greatest nation on earth, correct? Then why would anybody start up with the Jews? Because obviously, you don't start up with these people. You know? They, put, they, not, they, they didn't just vanquish Egypt. They demolished it, as we see. With the Red Sea, the whole Egyptian army was killed. And they left Egypt in an in, in, in economic disaster. You know, after the Borah got finished, and then the locusts and all that. There was nothing left in Egypt. And all the animals died. There's nothing left. So if you really think about it, what's going on here? You see? It's a suicide trip. So why would Amalek wage war with the Jews if they just destroyed Egypt? Not only that, we know that there's 600,000 males over the age of 20. So if you multiply that by 4, which is a family, that's 2.4 million Jews left Egypt. Do you have any idea how big the army of Amalek has to be to war with that type of population? It's insane. Ah. So when you begin to think about it, it makes no sense. It's impossible. Why would any nation go to war, ah, right? If there's no motive, it's a suicide trip, and it costs a fortune. That's the question. Therefore, Amalek is not a simple idea. We need to understand what is going on in their minds that they would war with the Jews. You see. <clears throat> And also one more question. <clears throat> Amalek appears right before Mount Torah, because that's when they fight Yoshua. Is there any significance in the fact that they appeared before the Jews received the Torah? Is that significant in and of itself? Maybe. We'll see. But in any case, it's very difficult to understand the whole posh of Amalek, because no nation in the world would ever have committed themselves to a war when it cost them a fortune, it's a suicide trip, and there's no reason to do it. There's no military threat, there's no ideological threat, right? There's no religious threat. So wh what's going on here? That is the question that I'm going to try to answer tonight. Okay? Meanwhile, everybody can sit there and puzzle over it, because it makes no sense. I think I've uh, sufficiently dramatized the improbability of Amalek making war against Jews. But we know what happened. Tell it up and lie. Why? <clears throat> In order to understand why, we need to understand certain concepts of mankind. <clears throat> man is a very, man means man and woman, mankind, are very interesting creatures in a certain sense. People are always thinking whether it be consciously or unconsciously. Believe it or not, everybody wants, everybody either wants to become God, or he thinks he's God, or he wants to overthrow God. He may not admit it, and that's only because God is so powerful he can't even begin to entertain such a thought. But the truth is, everybody would love to be God, right? If I took a show of hands, everybody here would love to be God. You don't know how to do it. Okay? So that in order to know how to become God, that didn't come to the next year. But anyway, but I you love to become God. You don't want that. You don't want that headache. What well, responsibility? Why not being me? What? Why not being me? Okay. Well, I'll tell you something. That's because you're not God. <laughs> if you were God, we'd have no problem being you. But that would be a contradiction because why would you, you know? Anyway. <laughs> okay? Uh, in any case, <coughs> everybody wants to be God, like I say. Who doesn't want to be omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, all over, right? Everybody wants that. Imagine, you never have to worry about bringing home a paycheck. It's incredible. So, you either want to be God, or you want to become God, uh, you want to become God, you think you are God, or you want to overthrow God. Well, it's one or the other. Okay. And the question is, do we see this in history? Yes. Let's take Odom Arishan, the first man. Mm. Why did Odom eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Why? Well, let's take a look at the argument that the Nohosh, 
the primordial snake, presented the Chava. He goes over to Chava, right, and he says to him different things, to the to the Machel, a bunch. But the real clincher was the what he said to her, right, Vison Kim, you could be God. You see? Why did Nochash use that argument? You want to become, you can become God? Because have a dream to become God. You know, you can't offer, if the Nochash wants to convince Chava, and she obviously followed the same arguments to Odom, you've got to convince them with an argument that they believe in, or they realize, hey, it's a good argument. Right? So he said, you can become God. What does that mean? What was his argument? So he said the following. He said, you know, you see that tree that God said not to eat? Uh, you, you know why he really, you know why he doesn't want to eat from that tree? Because he ate from that tree. Rashi says this. It's a medrash. He ate from the tree of good, knowledge of good and evil, and that's how he became God. There you are. You see, of course it was a lie, uh, but that's what he said. So what he was telling them, uh, and then subsequently to Adam, if you want to become God, just eat from the tree. Why doesn't God want you to eat from the tree? Because God was not, does not want any competitors. He doesn't want any rivals. He wants to remain God alone. Right? Uh, and that's why he told you not to eat from the tree. You see. So what do we see? And Adam, of course, Chava bought the argument. And then she relayed that and then she ate from the tree. And she realized the whole thing was a lie. Whatever. And then she came over to Adam and she said, by the way, she probably offered the same exact argument. Or else why would Adam have, rid- have eaten from it? There's an explicit command by God not to eat from it. So she clearly offered the same argument, right? But what was the real argument? What was the real attraction? Becoming God. But if they never entertained the thoughts of becoming God, why is that an argument? And the answer is, because anybody would love to become God. That's the concept. So Adamishan is an incredible proof, really, right, that the first man already thought about becoming God. He, he realized he wasn't God. Why did he realize that? Because he was created on the sixth day of creation, and he all of a sudden appeared in the whole Garden of Eden, so he realized he didn't make this, he couldn't fool himself, so he knew he didn't make this, so he knew that God made it. So he saw that God is an awesome being, because it must be incredible. You know, so he couldn't fool himself into thinking that he was God, but he certainly wanted to become God, and that the Nachash realized that, and he ordered that as an argument, and therefore Adam and Chava they both fell because of a hidden desire of man to be God. Where else do we see this? Well, let's take a look. In Pashas Noach, the Midgar Bovo, is a whole society building a tower uh, to war with God, right? It's the famous. They want, to, they want to overthrow God. Right? That's the whole point of the tower. Right? To make war with God. And it's not one guy. So you can say one guy is crazy. It was a whole society of Shino, which is probably Iraq. Ancient Iraq. And so on. Uh, the whole Iraq, they want to war with God. Because then they, they built the towers. Or it was a collective uh, job. Uh, so what do you see? That mankind is busy thinking about either how to become God or how to kill him, how to throw him out, you know, to take him over. It's historical proof. What about a person thinking he is God? Well, unfortunately, there are guys like that walking around. <laughs> right. However, power thought he was God. The pharaohs thought they were God. You know, <clears throat> even though clearly they know they're mortal. But the pharaohs thought they're God. And the Roman emperors think they're God. That's why they create so much stars and so on. But clearly there are people who are megalomaniacs. You know, they, they really think that they are God in whatever capacity and so on. Uh, so what do we see? So we see, therefore, that this thought that mankind has of being God, becoming God, overthrowing God, or whatever, is something which is really embedded in us. And we see that historically, that this is the case. The question is why? Why should a person have a desire to think that he is God, he wants to be God, right? He wants to overthrow God. What's the origin of this thought, or this delusion, I should say? Because that's really what it is. It's a delusion. I'll tell you why. Because the problem that man has is that when he's born, he's an infant. Intuitively, an infant knows it is helpless. Intuitively. It knows that it screams and there's nobody around. And all of a sudden, 
it feels this food coming into its mouth. And it begins to realize that it didn't put the food in its mouth. An infant is in tremendous contact with its helplessness. And this continues for years, you see. So therefore, what an infant begins to develop is the concept of inferiority. It begins to develop an inferiority complex. Who am I? What am I? I'm really nothing. Because I'm completely dependent on other people to survive. <clears throat> this concept of an infant's helplessness goes on for years and for years. And it never, it, it never evaporates at all. <clears throat> It's interesting, the unconscious mind doesn't know time. That's why there's so many adults that act like kids, if you have noticed. You know, why? Because the, for, the ideas that they developed in the mind when they were a child, okay, what happens is they repress those ideas because they were painful to admit. A kid doesn't want to admit that it's helpless. It tries to deny that because it's dangerous to admit that it's helpless because how am I going to survive? So that thought of inferiority becomes repressed. And once something becomes repressed, it goes into the, what's called the unconscious. Okay? So it's not available to the conscious mind. But that never goes away. And why is that? Because the unconscious doesn't know time. So even though a child grows up and it's clearly not helpless anymore, right? It's still embedded. That's why there's so many adults that act like kids. Because what they thought as a child is still there. Unless you remediate them with all kinds, with therapy, whatever, and so on. <clears throat> but every one of us has a child aspect to us. We've somehow never outgrown many of our childhood notions, and so on. <clears throat> Therefore, nobody wants to admit that they're helpless. Nobody wants to admit that we're inferior. Even when we get older, we still feel that we're inferior. <clears throat> How do we see this? What is the greatest psychological drive known to man? The greatest, actually, it's the second greatest. The, the greatest, second greatest drive known to man, okay, is who am I? What am I? It's the concept of inferiority. <clears throat> and therefore, everybody's trying to prove they're somebody. Ever notice? Whatever you do, you're always trying to prove you're somebody. But it's very subtle. But deep down, everybody's always trying to prove that there's something, there's somebody. There's a sense of self-esteem, self-worth. Self, the pursuit of self-worth <clears throat> really goes on the entire life, you see. Why does a guy donate a million dollars to a building? Why does he care? He's got his name on it. Because he wants his name on it. So what? Uh, because if he got, wants his name on it, what's going to happen? He's dead. And then people have to look at the plaque on the building and say, Wow, you know, Ruben gave a million dollars <clears throat> to the building. Ruben must be important. So therefore, this person says, ah, I want people to think I'm important. And if I'm important, then I am somebody. What do you mean? You're dead. So, you know, so what can you feel if you're dead? Does make a difference. As long as people think I'm somebody, even after he's dead, right? It's Hashuv. You see? Forget about on the lifetime. We're always trying to prove us somebody. That's the greatest psychological drive Basically, there is one drive which is more basic, which is self-preservation, the desire to exist and remain existing. But beyond that, everybody is seeking some type of affirmation of self-worth, you see. So therefore, where do we get this need to feel like somebody? Because we grew up as infants, you see. If a person would have grown up not as an infant, but as an adult, okay, which is interesting, then maybe he wouldn't have this feeling of inferiority and therefore the need to prove that he's somebody he's, he's, uh, he's important and so on <clears throat> this concept of needing to feel like somebody is a very important drive for a person it's responsible for an incredible amount of activities that we do even though we don't realize that <clears throat> it says in the Pesach Sene Matonis Yechia Right? If you hate gifts, you will live. Then you will live. Why? Because if you accept gifts, that proves that you're dependent on somebody else for gifts. But if you're dependent, what happens? All of a sudden, it proves that you are helpless. 
Because you need somebody else. Uh, it shows you that you are dependent. If you're dependent, it's hard to live with those kind of feelings. You see? So therefore, man is always trying to de- deny his sense of inferiority or his sense of self-worth, the loss of self-worth. <clears throat> this is a very important concept and explains a great deal of behavior. Why everybody wants to be remembered, you know, why people have to assert themselves, whether it be to their spouse or to be their, 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 their co-workers, because in some fashion they're always getting a feeling of worth. I'm somebody, see? Why do people try to control other people? Because if I control you, I'm somebody. Why does anybody want to collect so much money? Because money gives me the power to do anything, and if I can do anything, I won't feel like nobody. You see, a great deal of things are tied. Why does a guy have to feel he's got to have security? A huge bank account, you see? Because I'm a nobody, and I'm not going to be able to survive, so if I have a bank account, I'm adequate, I'll be able to survive. You cannot believe the amount of behaviors that we do to compensate or to address the problem of our own inferiority. Anyway, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot to talk about. But in any case, this leaves mankind in a terrible dilemma. What is the dilemma? A dilemma is a problem. What's the problem? If you do A, you're doomed. And if you do B, you're doomed. Either way you're doomed. You see, that's a, that's a classic dilemma. What does that mean? Notice, if you, if you have a boss, right? You hate your boss. You resent him. Now, if he's a good guy, you won't resent him as much. But if he's a bad boss, boss, God help him, right? Why do we resent authority figures? Why? Because, don't tell me what to do. Because if you tell me what to do and you control me, that proves I'm a nobody. So therefore, we resent authority immediately, you see. We resent the boss authority. Anybody who tries to control us, we resent. Why? Because it rubs against our need to feel like somebody. And when there's a boss over you, obviously, you're nobody. He can tell you what to do, and you better do it, or else he'll fire you and there's no money. You see? So that reinforces our feeling of inferiority. That's why mankind hates authority. All people hate authority. Uh, so if he's a good boss, fine. But deep down there's always a resentment. That's why everybody's trying to become the boss of everybody else. You see. And anyway, it presents man with a terrible dilemma. What's the dilemma? Here's the dilemma. <clears throat> if you believe in God, well, God is the boss. But wait a minute. I don't want a boss. I want to reject God. Because... I want to deny my own need for somebody else. So in many ways, to believe in God is difficult. Because in essence, you're believing in an authority figure. But that, in many ways, God is a boss. And he's a real boss. You know, and so on. You have to the line. But that automatically counters your need not to be bossed around. Because you want to feel like you're somebody. You see, and not only that, but God not only is, controls you, but God controls your behavior. tells you what to do. Don't tell me what to do. You know? How many times do we stop a guy and we say, Hey, excuse me. You know, where do you the boss? You know what I'm saying? Don't tell me what to do. I'm not going to go into with who we have to class all the time. But, but the essential idea is that we don't want to be told what to do. We want to live our lives according to where we want to live our lives. Get out of my way. Basically is what we all feel. Okay? This is human nature. So therefore, a religious person, somebody who believes in God, has got a real problem. He's got a real dilemma. Why? Because if he believes in God, right, uh, then he, in a certain sense, he resents God. Because God stops him from enjoying life. You see? So, that's one bad thing. On the other side, if he rejects God, well, if he believes in God, God's going to come after you. Because there's a concept of accountability. Isn't there? Right? There's accountability. Right? God says, hey, this is my list of things you need to do. And if you don't do it, you're going to be judged. That's called accountability. Right? Uh Uh-oh. So it's a dilemma. What do I do? If I reject God, correct, then uh, then I got problems because He didn't come after me. Right? If I reject Him. If I accept Him, then I feel like a nobody. You know, I, I don't want Him to stop me from enjoying life. You see. 
That's a real dilemma. What do people do? <coughs> well, I have to tell you something. Mankind is brilliant. They found a solution. Yes. We find solutions to problems that annoy us or problems that we can't solve. We found a solution. But mankind has found a solution to this dilemma. If you believe in God and you want to enjoy life, how do you have your cake and eat it too, as they say in English? Can you do both? Can somebody who wants to live his own life accommodate the belief in God at the same time? Or would he not? But the truth is, mankind has solved the problem. What is the solution to this problem? Well, you'd be shocked at what the solution is. The solution to this dilemma is all the religions of the world. Yes, as we've seen. Each religion really compromises God. And you do an incredible job. And we will go through the religions. And I will show you what mankind has done. And then you begin to understand Amalek. And really what Judaism is. Let's take a look at the religions of the world. How they address this dilemma. Uh, well, you can believe in God, right? And do what you want. Let me show you how. Well, there are different strategies. And each strategy is called a religion. You see. A religion is nothing more than a strategy of how to accommodate God. And do what you want. Let's take a look. Okay, what's the first, what's the best or the greatest strategy of all? Atheism. Don't believe in God. You don't believe in God, what's the problem? You can do whatever I want. Right? Uh, so therefore, atheism is a strategy <clears throat> not to allow God to interfere with your life. It's really what it is. But what's the problem with atheism? You know, you have to be an idiot to be an atheist. Why? <laughs> why is that? Okay? Why, why, why is that? <clears throat> Because the greatest proof that there must be a supreme being that created everything is the incredible complexity of life. It's impossible. The human mind or the brain has over a hundred billion neurons. It's massive. The body itself, right, has a hundred trillion cells. Well, a lot of it is really bacteria, but anyway. But it has an enormous amount of cells. Each cell is a factory. There are more chemical reactions going on in a cell, or certainly the, the, the human body, than all the chemical reactions in the entire world. Who ordered this? You know how complex that is? It's beyond belief. In fact, I will illustrate it. It's a very cute idea, very interesting. Okay? This is a beautiful illustration. Well, you cannot be an atheist. Out west, a hundred years ago, there's a whole bunch of guys playing a poker game. Okay? Now, they had a pot in the middle, right? The money. It was out west. These cowboys, right? And they're, and they're playing poker. Okay, all of a sudden, some guy puts down his hand, right? And his hand was a straight flush. Now, I don't play poker, so I, I'm not sure what that is, but I think what it is is a, uh, it's like uh, four, five, six, seven, eight of one sweep, like clubs or hearts, whatever. Uh, maybe there's some Mavinia over here. Guys don't know what this is. But anyway, he has a straight flush. Puts it down. And everybody says, forget it. I, I can't be a straight flush. You know how rare that is? You know? So the guy takes his hand, and he's about to put on the money. And all of a sudden, one of the guys on the side, the cowboy is playing also, he stops him and says, excuse me, what are you doing? He says, what am I doing? I got a straight flush. You know? Nobody's going to beat this. He says, yeah. And he throws down his hand, and it's a royal flush. I think what a royal flush, right, is, um, is nine, ten, jack, queen, king, ace. Ten, jack, queen, king. Ten, jack, queen, and thank you. Okay? All right? It's a royal flush. That's, that's the top of the line. Am I right? Okay. Uh, however, so everybody's stunned. A straight flush and a royal flush in the same hand. So the guy with the straight flush stands up. And he says, you no good, dirty cheater. He pulls out his gun and he kills the guy with the royal flush. Now, forget about if the guy with the royal flush 
deserves death. I'm not going into that. Maybe out west they had a different set of rules for what justice is. But the question is, what is me? How do you know he cheated? Maybe you really had the royal flush. You had the straight, you had the royal, so give you laws. How do you know the guy cheated? So they asked this guy, how do you know he cheated? He cheated. What? He cheated. No. No. You know how? Because he said the probability that in one hand that there should be a straight flush and a royal flush is a one followed by 40 zeros. You know what 40 zeros is? <coughs> it's a number that we don't even imagine. <coughs> now, so he turns to the guy and says, okay, what, what should I assume? Uh, that this was the one time in the 40 zeros that it happened, and maybe Taka had happened, or that the guy cheated, which is more reasonable. Of course, that the guy cheated. <coughs> the probability that an insulin molecule should develop by itself is a one followed by 80 zeros. <coughs> Come on, 80 zeros? Therefore, it's impossible, really, to be an atheist. It's impossible. In fact, what's interesting, there was a skeptic, I forgot his name in England. He was a, he was a big skeptic, and he used to try to uh, teach in Oxford, I think he was. And finally, when he was very old, he said, I forget, I believe in God. So they were shocked, these students. You believe in God? You've been preaching there's no God. Atheism for all the years. Skeptic, skepticism. Uh, so they asked him why. So he said, because complexity, it's impossible. When you look at the complexity of the world, it is impossible to think that this occurred by chance. It's like what Fred Hoyle, a famous cosmologist, once said. He said, the probability that this world came about by chance, the 100 million, or rather the 100 million uh, life forms and so on, whatever, <laughs> chance, it, it, that it's, it's, it's more likely that a hurricane went through a junkyard, right? And all of a sudden, in the junkyard, was sitting a Boeing 747. That's more likely than for this world to have been created by chance, or have by chance. This is a god of fed oil, you know. In any case, so you can't be an atheist. But, you know what you can't be? You can be an agnostic. Agnostic says, I don't know, prove it. Or in other words, maybe there's a god, maybe there isn't. So, until you prove it, I'm going to do what I want. You see? That's the strategy. Right? If God comes and talks to me, fine, then I'll do it. But if not, then I can do whatever I want. So agnosticism is a strategy. Right? To do whatever you want. But, it's hard to be an agnostic. Again, because of the complexity. So we now have to go to the real concept of religion. Uh, so we come to the religion of Aristotle. Aristotle believed there was a God, the first cause, and he created the universe. But then God removed himself from the universe, right? He created the world and said, okay, you guys, you're on your own. Great. If we're on our own, there's no, there's no standard, there's no accountability, do whatever you want. So you can believe in a God, the, the, the Aristotelian God, and do what you want. Strategy, you see? So then already we begin to enter the concept of religion. So you can accommodate doing what you want with religion by believing that God has nothing to do with the universe. That's number three. Number four. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to work because it's obviously, and by the way, God counters that belief by saying, I am the Lord your God that took you out of the land of Egypt, which means I intervene in the fears of man. That statement that I took you out of Egypt directly contradicts Aristotle. That God intervened in the affairs of man and he took the Jews out of Egypt. Very important phrase. Okay, so that's three. Number four, a fourth strategy. What's that? You believe in two gods. Zoroastrians believe in two gods. Persia, that's the religion of Persia. In the olden days, certainly. What do they believe in? They believe in a god of good and a god of evil. And they're at war with each other. So you know what I do? The guy says, I'm going to align myself with the God of evil. Because he's evil. I can do whatever I want. You see? I, the God of good, yeah, the God of evil, protect me. You see? So by creating two kinds of gods, good and evil, he's protected. And therefore he can do whatever he wants. That's a strategy. You see? That's a fourth strategy. <clears throat> However, is that really great strategy? No. 
There's a better strategy. Bilam. When the Rebbeinu whipped the king off the Bilam, when he sent him to, when Bala called him to curse the Jewish people, so on the way God, there were the messengers from Bilam, a Bullock, so God says to Bilam in a dream, who are these guys outside? So Bilam said to himself, hmm, that's very interesting. I thought God was omniscient, he knows everything. Clearly God doesn't know everything. If that's the case, wow. So if I, I can do whatever I want, God won't know it because he's not omniscient. What a solution. That means I can actually try to do things that he won't know because he doesn't know everything. Bilam. That's what Bilam's belief was, you see. So that's a, a fourth strategy. <clears throat> Actually, it's a fifth. A sixth strategy. And most of the world has adopted this strategy. Certainly in ancient times. Polytheism. The belief of many gods. How does that help you? The Greeks be- believe in a pantheon of gods. There are 50 gods that they believe in. And Rome, and these are major powers for a thousand years. They, and, and, and at that time, the paganism, which is really polytheism, how does that help you? And the answer is, because if you believe in many gods, right, each god would have a different shika. He has his own ideas and values, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the Kula Ebez Shammai and the Kula Ebez Yilla. You see, I'm going to take whatever I want to do, I'll always find a god that will say it's okay. So therefore, by believing in many gods, right, I can pick and choose which god I want to believe in and worship, because between them all, they're going to allow me to do everything. Right? Brilliant. That's the belief of polytheism. I can pick and choose whatever I want. You see? Another strategy. Okay. What happens if you're not polytheistic? So you're going to do another strategy. I'm showing you major religions of the world are really based on this. Another strategy. Well, I want to do a lot of things. I want to murder. Right? So what am I going to do? So I will believe that my God murders. I'm going to invest in God the exact same vices and bad things that I want to do. I'm going to say that He does it. And that's exactly what the Greeks did. They made their gods commit vices, murder, jealousy, you name it. You know, if you're familiar with any of the Greek mythology and so on. So therefore, Agbaba, there's a mitzvah called the Torah, Lihidamas Bedrochov, to imitate God. That's exactly what they did. But the brilliant thing is they, uh, they had God actually doing the things that they would love to do. You see. Another strategy is where, okay, God isn't dead, but you know, the Avreda will be immoral. Vices, immorality, that's the Avreda. You'll find many religions in ancient times that all kinds of immor- immoral service, without getting into the gory details of it and so on. And even about Paul, which the Torah mentions, the Avreda, if you, if you know what it is, is, is the Avreda of excretion. They used to excrete right in front of their God. Why would they do that? Are they crazy? Because it was an avoider of such degradation, right, that you can do anything, even if it's degrading. Uh, you see, uh, if you look at religions, it's incredible what man thought of, just to get away from believing and having to do what God wants. So what they did is the avoider, you see, they, they had the, all kinds of the vestal virgins, right? I, I don't know to the avoiders, but they had all kinds of incest. You know, licentiousness going on, immorality, in the, their temples. Oh, why? Because that's the Avoida. So on the contrary, it's Muta, it's a mitzvah, right? Okay. Another strategy is where God changed his mind. Yeah, Christianity. In the beginning, God created the world, they gave the Torah. But he saw the Torah was so difficult, so he changed his mind. He said, if you believe in my kid, that he gave his life to my kid. If he gave his life for grace, it's called grace. He gave his life in order, he was crucified on the cross, in order to redeem mankind, right? That's all you need to do to get rid of Mahabal. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, so God changed his mind. He, the, the, the original basis for the Jews, and now it's the Christians, right? Not only that, he changed the Torah. Originally it was the Torah, and now it's the New Testament. You see, uh, so therefore you change your mind and you now remove all the, the mitzvahs 
That's incredible. So in order to get in the Mahabha, all you have to do is believe that this guy came along and sacrificed his life, right, in order to redeem mankind from this, the original sin of Adam, whatever they say. And so, right? But that's incredible. Oh, you see, that that is what they believe, and that removes all the mitzvahs. Everything, basically. And then the last one is always very interesting. Right? A guy sins. He's got to be worried. He sins. He needs a kapora. Right? It costs a lot of money to, bring, uh, to get in, uh, buy an animal for a khatas. If you do an, a, a shoigeg, uh, a sin in shoigeg, or, or whatever, it costs a lot of money. You've got to bring a khatas. That's an animal. That costs at least a thousand dollars to bring that animal, five hundred dollars. You know? So you wouldn't sin so often because it costs a lot of money. Right? But ha, huh, there's a better way. Why is that? What's the problem here? Because the problem is the only one who can forgive you is God. Alright? And you want forgiveness from God, you've got to do a certain amount of things. <coughs> oh, so Christianity, Roman Catholicism, came up with an incredible idea. The priest can forgive you in confession. Yeah. Man can forgive man. Isn't that incredible? But of course, when man is going to forgive man, what is he going to do? He's going to ask you for a donation. Won't he? And there you are. They used to buy the kaporas. And after a while, that's called confession. Right? You give to the church, whatever, and you get a kapora. That's what confession is. Because they gave the power of kapora to man, to the priest. After a while, it got so bad, that the priest would say, listen, you know, there's a sale on today. Right? If you do one sin, it's a hundred bucks. Right? So normally you do two sins, Two hundred dollars, but it's a sale for one hundred fifty bucks. I will forgive you not only for what you did, but for what you will do. It's called the mafreya. Uh, obviously, that it got out of hand because <coughs> which is incredible. So Luther, that's why he rebelled against the Catholic Church, right? That's why he created Protestantism. Luther, and he said, "This is ridiculous." It's called indulgences. After a while, they were they, they were selling the ability to do sins in the future. For hard cash. That's why the church was the richest institution in the world in the Middle Ages. You see. Anyway, look at all these incredible strategies. Why are they? What do they do? They all allow you to believe in God and do whatever you want. They all neutralized, compromised God. That's what it is. So what happens? A war come to Jews. And they said, oh no. Here's what the Jews did. Here's what the Jews did. One, there's a God. One. There's only one God. Forget about the rest of the crew. You know, there's no polytheism here. There's only one God. Not only that, He is righteous. He is moral. He's ethical. Right? He's just. Not like the other guys. Right? And not only that, He wants you to be righteous and just and moral and ethical. Uh oh, there's no exit. Where's the strategy? How do I do what I want to do and believe in God? With Judaism, you can't do that, really. Because if you believe in God in Judaism, in a certain sense, you're stuck. You see, because there's no strategy where you can compromise God. Very important idea. And now you know a very important concept. Why did Nimrod hate Avraham Avinu? Why? <clears throat> what did Avraham Avinu do? Okay, so he smashed a couple of idols. You know? Why did he hate him so much to throw him into the, into the first song? Because what Avraham said was radically different than everybody else. Avraham Avinu said, oh, this is what Judaism is. There's only one God. He is righteous. I'm just Sadiq Yosho, said Nazino. Right? And not only that, he said, not only is God this way, but all your other gods are wrong. See, everybody else, if you're polytheistic, everybody's right. Right? You know, you can worship here, you can worship there. Everybody's right. But Judaism says everybody's wrong. Except us. You see? Wow. So therefore, uh, so Nimrod said, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. We're, we're all wrong and you're right. There's no exit. There's no compromise possible. You're the most dangerous man alive. You need to be put to death. Because your form of belief destroys us. It destroys our ability to do whatever we want and then to feel like a somebody. You see. And that tells you a very important concept. Why is there anti-Semitism? 
There are many reasons. Jealousy. Why? A lot of reasons. But I believe the real reason boils down to one idea. Anti-Semites don't hate Jews. They hate God. Because of what he did to them. And therefore they hate us. Because we are his ambassadors. That's why. They never forgot, forgave the Jew for introducing Jews to Judaism. They never forgave us. But in the end, what we did, in many ways, is we, we gave them a conscience. You see. We made them into whips. We forced them to serve God. Not that God serves man, but man has to serve God. The origin of anti-Semitism is, it goes, is the Jew, what he believes in, goes contrary to the thing that a, a person wants. And that is to be independent, fully self-functioning, and don't tell me what to do. Uh, that's the root of anti-Semitism, you see. And intuitively, everybody knows the concept of the Bible, right, the Torah. The Bible is the greatest book ever published, and it's world known. And when you read the Bible, what's the first thing you begin to see? The righteousness of God, the justice, right, the morality, the ethics. And, and, and so on, you know, uh, what do you think a guy feels when he's reading that? Part of, he's at war with himself. Part of him would like to believe this. I mean, part of him says that you have in mind. You believe this, you can't do anything. Because you have to do exactly what God wants. That is the origin of anti-Semitism. In the end. And that's the concept of Avraham Avinu trying to be killed by, by, uh, by Nimrod. It's interesting. You see. One more idea. It says in the Torah, uh, we call the mountain Torah was made by Hasinai, yes? The mountain of Sinai. So the Chazal say, why is it called Sinai? Because it's a Russian of Sinah. Because mountain Torah at Sinai brought Sinah to the world. Hatred. Hatred? Where did that come from? What I'm saying. Because Sinai brought a religion that doesn't allow man to compromise God. And therefore everybody hates that. And therefore they hate the Jew because he is the bringer, the messenger of what the Bosha wants. That's the Sinai. Because other than that, it doesn't make any sense. On the contrary, the Torah introduced an incredible amount of what? Of morality and so on, how society can live with each other. But what the Torah did is far more than that. It brought Sinai it does not allow man to do whatever he wants. You cannot compromise God. That's the sinner. And if we intuitively, you feel difficult to accept the terror because it goes against the grain of human nature, you see. Now that you understand this, okay, we can now go back to what? To all the questions I asked about Amalek. What was the first question I asked? Okay, first question. Why did they go to war with the Jews? There's no military threat. No. It's true, there's no military threat. But there is an ideological threat. Amalek intuitively realized that what the Jews are about to offer the world is a religion which is intolerable because it doesn't allow us to compromise anything. You know, it, it makes us slaves submit to the Varshlam. We can't allow that. And therefore they said, which is incredible, ah, what we must do is we must kill the Jews. We cannot allow a religion that offers no strategy to compromise. You see. So it was a, a religious problem, not a military problem. And they hated the Jews so much because of that, just like Sinai, Sinai that they were willing to commit suicide, most and nefesh for that, because they knew they would lose. You can't fight a nation that just wiped out Egypt. You can't fight a nation that not even wiped out Egypt, right? It's got 2.4 million people, right? You can't do that. And not only that, it's a fortune. To, to spend money on that kind of a, a war is a fortune to cross five borders. But it's worth it to destroy this nation. Because they are bringing something intolerable to the world. You see, that answers who a monarch really is. They cannot stand the fact that Judaism does not allow them to do whatever they want, and therefore they're willing to be moist and nefesh, even if it means their own death. And you will see, in a little while, an incredible historical precedent for that. But now you understand something else.
Why is Ken Ali Behetz? And also you understand why they attacked right before Martin Turo. Because the Torah was about to be given, right? That would have given this religion to the people, to, to the world. Uh, so right before the Torah was given, they had to attack the Jews. Because they knew the Jews were going to go to Sinai, because they told that to Parai, we want to worship our God on that mountain. So they knew that the Jews were going to receive something at Sinai, but wherever it is, it's going to be Judaism. And Judaism is anathema to human nature. So here's a nation that hated Jews, Sinai, because they were going to do so religion that you cannot compromise God. And now that answers really the ultimate question. Why does God hate Amalek? You look at the Torah and say, wow, Mochel Timche, you didn't kill him, you, you killed him. My seat isn't filled, my kise, ki yoda case caught. Right? The hand of Amalek is against the throne of God. And therefore, Mochel Timche, you have to wipe out every man, woman, and child. We're talking about God who is infinite Bachmoris. Why? How do we understand this? And the answer is, because the most dangerous man in the world, or the most dangerous nation, is a nation that mocks, not God, but the sovereignty of God. Notice what it says, Kiyot, the hand of Amalek is against the throne of God. It doesn't say that the hand of Amalek is against God. Right? It's just the throne. What is the throne? The say, Right? The throne is the symbol of the sovereignty of his ability to rule over you. Sure they believe in God, because they're polytheistic, you know? But what they did is they rebelled against his sovereignty, his ability to command us in an absolute way. It's Meduyak in the Posset. That's why. So not only does the Vosh say, that's the most thing, I'd rather have an atheist than an Amaleki. Why? Because an atheist, and eventually he'll grow wise and he'll say, hey, so you think you can't be an atheist? You know? But if you believe in God and you compromise God, you've mocked his own mouth with Shemayim. You've mocked the whole concept of the own mouth with Shemayim, which is the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. That's why we say Kriyashma twice a day. To be recovered the oil. You see? It is so important to accept the sovereignty of God that we say it twice a day. And that's exactly what they were against. The oil mouth of Shemayim. You see? That's why God said, you need to wipe them out. You need to wipe the sacred out. Because God does not want anybody to remember them. Because to remember them is to repeat their philosophy. And to repeat their philosophy means to make it attractive to people. We need to compromise. You see? So if the greatest enemy of God is a person that not denies his existence, but who mocks his ability to issue commandments, his sovereignty. In fact, an incredible reverence is what? How do you spell Amalek? Ayin, Mem, Lamed, Kuf. Yes? That's the Russian tables of Oil Marcus Melchidu. The same Isis. Oil Marcus Melchidu. That the kingdom of heaven they won't accept. So it's not that they deny the existence of God, because they believe in gods. They deny his ability to be a sovereign. So they create a compromise. But what's even worse is that they were willing to be mercenaries. That type of self-sacrifice demands that they be wiped out. You see? And it, it answers a fundamental question of why God hates them so much. <clears throat> now that we understand this, we can understand some things about Haman. Right? Homan doesn't make sense. Again, when you look at Homan, what he did is absurd. Let me show you. Okay? Ahasuerus is the greatest emperor of all. Got 127 countries under him. What an empire. Okay? And who's the second in command, the Grand Vizier? It's Homan. Correct? Homan is the Grand Vizier. <clears throat> now, you mad at Mordechai because Mordechai doesn't bow to you. Right? Okay, so kill Mordechai. What do you want to kill all the Jews for? Are you crazy? I mean, you know, Haman isn't stupid. Right? You don't become stupid and become the Grand Vizier. You're a bright guy. You see, what are you killing all the Jews for? You know, like Mordechai, kill him. What are you doing this? What kind of a racist is that? Who have I heard of something like that? You see. And not only that, nobody wants to wipe out an entire nation. You need the economy, the economically. The Jews are very loyal and so on. 
So why would he kill everybody? First question. Second question. Okay. He asked one of his guards, who's this guy that's not bound to me? So the guy said, and they told him he's Mordecai Hayyuhudi. Hayyuhudi is a Jew. Well, who cares what he is? Kill the guy and finish. Why the fact is he identified as a Jew makes such a difference? Third question. Why does the Megillah always keep saying Homan Hwagogi Ben Hamdoso and so on? Right? Well, it's always repeating his yichos. You know, he said it once, we know who guy is, and that's all. Why do we need a constant reminder of his genealogy? And the fourth question is even more bizarre. What was his argument to Achashverus to kill him? Because he needed Achashverus' permission. He goes to Achashverus and says, listen to this. Yes, I'm Mufurit, Mufuza, and there's a nation, they ain't dust. Their religion is different. You know, everything about them is different. You know, if you approve, let me kill them all. So obviously Achashverus said, excuse me, you want to kill the Jews? You know how much tax I lose? So he said, okay, I'll give you 10,000 talents of silver in order to compensate for the fact that you won't get the, 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 the money from them. How much is 10,000 talents of silver worth in today's terms? The, the estimate is worth $100 million. A lot of money. He's a very wealthy man of money. That's what you become when you're the grand vizier. You know? The one who obviously learned from Holman is uh, Hillary Clinton. But anyway, <laughs> you know, if you're up there, you can, you can bribe everybody you know, and just collect for all the bribes. But in any case, uh, but it doesn't make sense. We know that, that Ahasuerus ruled over 127 different countries. But wait a minute, each one had their own religion, didn't they? They had their own belief system, their own social values, their own culture, their religion. So how can you say the Jews have a different religion? Does it make any sense? Everybody has a different religion. So what was the argument that Haman said? Got it? It makes no sense. So therefore, this is what happened. Homan saw that Mordechai doesn't bow. And that was bizarre. Why? Because when the Grand Vizier comes in front of you, you bow. Why? Because it's to your benefit that you show him obeisance, as they say, right? And if you do that, he'll like you, and maybe he'll do things for you, right? Like cut your real estate property tax, right? And so on, right? That's what a guy does, because it benefits him. But he saw Mordechai doesn't want to bow. So he realized Mordechai must believe in a God that doesn't, cannot be compromised. You want to bow for your benefit, too bad. Right? No, God says you cannot bow before man. So he realized that. He said, wait a minute. This guy's not bowing, even though it's beneficial to him, because he must have a belief system where his God doesn't allow right, any compromise, even if you benefit. So he asked his God, who's this guy? So the God said, he's Jew. Oh, so he said, he's a Jew? Wait a minute. I'm an Amaleki. I have a Yichus. My ancestors took on a mission to kill all the Jews precisely because they cannot compromise God. So therefore, I need to take up that slag and finish the job. And therefore, I need to kill Mordecai and all the Jews because I need to do what my ancestors did. I need to take up their cause and do it also. Ah, that's what he realized. And that's why the Mithkila constantly says the Yichus. Why? Because he's not doing it because only he hates the Jews. He really took up the mission of Amalek, his ancestors. And the Mishnah wants to show you that that's really what he's doing, right? And so they keep repeating his Yichus all the way up to Agog, which goes back to Amalek. And that's what he told our Hashverosh. He said, listen, of course we have 127 different religions. But these guys are not like anybody, they're not like anybody else. Everybody else figured out how to compromise God. These guys insist that you can't. They're different than every other religion on the world that they've shown you. Right? <coughs> we got to do away with them. In fact, they're the most dangerous species of all. This is the concept of Homer. What do we see is today? It's incredible what we see today. I told you that the real origin of anti-Semitism is they've never forgiven the Jews for what they did to us. Right? Which is what? You've made us into wimps. You give us, gave us a conscience. We'll never forgive you for that. You see? Yeah, of course on one side they say we accept the Bible. Yeah, of course. But deep down, there's a tremendous resentment. Because you've taken away, you've forced them to submit to another authority, which is anathema to human nature. 
But what happens now? Right? Who did that? Hitler, you Do you know why Hitler hated the Jews? He writes that in Mein Kampf. He writes that in Mein Kampf. The reason why he hated the Jews, because the Jews, he says, they have made mankind into wimps. He has given them a conscience with their morality nonsense. That's why he hated the Jews. Who does that sound like to you? It's a Molek. Germany is a Molek. And Hitler is a Duke of Homer. Without going to how. But he is repeating the exact same argument as a Molek. And he wrote that. And that's why he hated the Jews. He writes that. Because you with them you cannot compromise God. And if you think about it, what did Hitler believe in? Nietzsche. The Superman. Deutschland Iberalis. That's their anthem. Right? Who ever heard of something like that? Blonde hair, blue eyes, the Aryan race. They're a bunch of megalomaniacs. A megalomaniac should submit to God? Excuse me. Uh, the very nature of Germany is to oppose God. You see. And therefore, that's what he writes. Hitler said, oh, it's really an Austrian. But Austria is really German. And so on. And therefore, that's why he wanted to kill the Jews. Because they believe in the opposite. They believe in the supremacy of man, which is Nietzsche's philosophy. So the exact opposite, the most dangerous thing to their philosophy is Judaism. And since the Jews represent Judaism, we need to, we need to kill them. It's a very important idea. But there's something even more incredible. There's a book called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shira. He writes an incredible idea, a uh, historical fact. He said at the end of the war in 1945, what was happening? Hitler, the, the, the generals came over to Hitler and they said to him, you know, we're losing the war. It's over. You, you dream of a third, thousand year Third Reich, right? Third Reich, thousand years? Forget it, it's not going to last a year. We're losing the war. So Hitler said to them, why? What's the problem? Germans were incredible fighters. I mean, they could have conquered the world. If not for the fact that God stopped them, they would have conquered the world. In any case, so Hitler asked them, what's the problem? So he answered, the generals answered, because instead of using the cars, the, 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 the railroad cars, to ship the troops to the front, you're using them to ship the Jews to the concentration camps. We don't have any railroads. And therefore we have nobody fighting. So you need to stop this. Stop obsessing about the destruction of the Jews. Do you know what Hitler told them? Get lost. When you get lost, you've just condemned Germany to lose the war. It's astounding. Doesn't that sound like Messias Nefesh? It's, it's a moment all over again. His obsession with killing the Jews because they refuse to compromise God is the greatest evil of mankind. Because they gave mankind a conscience, right? He was so obsessed with killing them, which is classic Amole, right? That he was willing to commit suicide, which is what he did. He committed suicide in the end, and Germany lost the war. In fact, if you think about it, Hitler was the greatest traitor of Germany. Because it's madness. No guy would have done that. He said, oh, forget about the Jews. You know, I'm dreaming, dreaming of a thousand year third Reich. Right? Is he out of his mind? But he put the destruction of the Jewish people above the victory of Germany. And he was willing to go to the grave because of it. Who does that sound like? Amalek. It's exactly what it is. So Amalek never died. It still exists. But most people have to harbor those ideas. <clears throat> but they keep it down. Because they practice their religions. They compromise God in many ways. You see, every once in a while, some guy gets up, just says openly, I hate the Jews. But that is the origin of anti-Semitism, really. And Hitler was the proof. You see, once you understand that, you understand certain various ideas. And so on. You know. Do you ever notice, why does the Torah always say, right? Bayas Moshe, Katzel, Kashe, Tivar, Shems Moshe. And Moses did exactly as God commanded why? It's a numerous amount of times. And Moshe did what God commanded him. What's that mean? Because he never inserted his own ideas to compromise God. That was the greatest thing. When a Jew does exactly what God wants. Kashetzivo Hashem es Moshe. As God has commanded Moshe. 
That's the greatest shvach phrase, which means that he doesn't insert any of his own ideas, any of his own needs, any of the strategies of all religions. He does exactly to the letter of what God wants. That's why it says that. You see, <coughs> it's amazing when you think about it. <coughs> There's an idea which I once heard from Shalom Shvadron, famous Magid. You know, it said in the Yom Kippur Tavlin, you know, when you cut al khayt and so on, it says, I, I forgive me, why? Because, Masha or Sal, that which you forbade, he tarti, I permit it. And it also says, Umasha, he tarto, but what you forbade, I made forbidden. So, Rav Shalom said, wait a minute, I understand this. I can understand you need a kapora because you said it was forbidden, and I mounted it. So it's a chet. But if you permitted it, and I asked it, why not a chet? Uh, so he said a very important concept. But it's a long time ago. He said, because the chet there isn't because he did an avera. Because he didn't. It's permitted by God, because if you want to forbid it, fine. But why did you forbid it? Because there's an ego involved. Because you want to prove you're somebody. Alright? So therefore, I said it was permitted. So who are you to say it's forbidden? Uh, because you're obviously investing self, ego, in it. Because if I put it, everybody's going to say, wow, what an incredible Thomas Chochem. You know, he, he asked it. <coughs> he was Machmer. Don't be Machmer. It's good though. Because you put in your own ego. You didn't do Kashet Siva Hashem as Moshe. You see, and that's the Chet. It's interesting. So we understand, look what we understand now. You should know, the greatest pitfall in Yavuido, the greatest, is to compromise God. You see, not to deny God. People don't deny God. We're not at the overthrowing God, right? We're not crazy, right? We're not to think we are God, and we don't think we can become God, right? So what do we do? We're always trying to compromise God. It's called looking for Hetera. Now, it's more okay, look for Hetera, if there's a Hetera. <coughs> you see, but mankind is always involved in compromising devotion. And you can't do that really. Yeah, you follow the Shulchan Aruch. It's mutter, it's mutter, that's fine. Uh, you see, <coughs> but you notice too, therefore, that mankind is preoccupied always with compromising devotion. Because a person always wants to do what he wants to do. He wants to rebel against authority. That's what he has to do. And this is really in the end what Ammonic was. Ammonic was a nation that realized that the Jews, they were the first true anti-Semites. Egypt was not anti-Semitic. They, were just, they just wanted slaves. You know, they, and therefore they used, they used the Jews. Did they hate the Jews per se? No. If they would have hated the Jews, the Levi, Levi never did any avoid, or Levi was never subjugated in Egypt. They would have killed Levi too. You see, um, but they didn't hate them. But they, you see, they weren't truly anti-anti-Semitic because the Jews <coughs> were there, but they needed their economics. That's why. Uh, same thing with Roman Greece. Roman Greece didn't really hate the Jews. They just stood in their way of power. You know, Greeks they stood in their way to rebel. Don't rebel. We want to control you, right? We want to take your territory. We want to charge you tax and so on. Where did anti-Semitism? first originate. Do you know where? Christianity. That's where it begins. Because they, we, we, we kill their God, so to speak. And that's the real hatred of Jews. That's where it began. You see. Because you know, we don't believe in their guy. Right? We believe in the Torah. But the Torah you cannot compromise. You see. But their guy, right, in the New Testament it says, I come not to abrogate the, the law of Moses which is the biggest joke, because then he abrogates everything. Abrogate means to nullify. Then he nullifies everything. You see, that's what the New Testament does. Just to get rid of the whole, all the mitzvahs, and so on. So therefore, they hate Jews for that. Because their guy himself was Jewish, you see, which bothers them to this day. Right? And not only that, their religion compromises what Judaism doesn't. This is the concept of Amorit. Amorit isn't something that existed a long time ago. Amorit is a, is a here and now phenomenon. Now. And that's really Germany and all the anti-Semites out there. Why does everybody hate you so much? You know, why do you hate the Jews? Stop it, it's because of the double standard. What's the problem of Christians all the time? And the answer is, 
This is the answer. Because Torah created Sinai. Sinai. Why? Because we gave them a religion, a set of beliefs that does not allow God to be compromised. There's only one God. He is righteous, just in everything. And He is an absolute ruler. He, ha- he, uh, he has accountability. And you need to toe the line or else you've got problems later on. That's the true origin of anti-Semitism. That's Amalek. But Amalek was most a nefesh to do it. Just like Hitler in Machimai. He'd rather die than have the Jews remain. You see? So, this is the key of Amalek. And now you know why God hates them. Because it's the greatest mockery of all. The mockery where you believe in God, yet you mock His sovereignty. You're not macabre the old mockers. So what's the whole point? What's the whole point? If you do whatever you want to God, the whole thing is a joke. You see, God does not, God does not tolerate jokes. Not that kind. He can deal with an atheist. Or he can deal with somebody who's a bit of a disorder. You know. But don't believe in me and then pull up the strategy where you can do whatever you want. That is completely against and that is so important, we say Kriyashma twice a day. You see, that's how important that is. You see. In any case, so this is the penis of Amalek, it's something to remember. And you also understand ideas of Haman, that he, all he did was he followed up on the mission of his ancestors. You see? And that's why he said Nachashverosh. What they do is no other religion does that. There's no exit, there's no out. You need to kill them all. You know, and thank God, God protects us from that. You see, but this is the, the this is what's called the eternal problem that Jews have, is that we represent God, we represent His belief system, and and people will always hate us for that. I don't care who they are, but it's, it doesn't always have to be that way. A person can submit. You see, <clears throat> look, Islam hates us also for that reason, because what they do, they chucked all the mitzvahs. That's what they did. And not only that, they can kill everybody because they said their God kills. Infidel. Wipe out the infidel. That's where ISIS gets its whole head done. You know? They do exactly one of the strategies. They want to murder, so they just said. God, God said, and they put that in the Quran, that God said, murder the Jews, you know, whatever, behind the tree, whatever the, the expression is, and so on. Any case, this is the genius, uh, this is the depth of the problem that Judaism has. The problem that the world has with Judaism. And it never disappears. Never. And it will go on to the end of time, until the Bosch finally says, I'm tired of this whole business, and also the Bosch will reveal himself. And could you believe the shock when people realize that the nation that they so despise, even the, 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 the stone that the builders despised, became the cornerstone. Let's hope that it's this year, right? With the entrance of Mashiach, and, uh, and then we should be re- redeemed from all these terrible, terrible, uh, you know, uh, events that occur on a daily basis. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes? It seems, it seems like this concept of melody is actually inherent truth in, the word, in God's design of the Torah. In other words, <coughs> in a certain sense, yes, because uh, yeah, really, you know what the ultimate concept of man is? It's the same as Odom or Ishmael. What was the real concept of Odom? To eat from the tree or not? No, that's not his conflict, right? His problem wasn't the diet. His problem is who's the, who's the real God, right? Is God himself subject to another force called the tree? Or can I become God? Man rebels against God. That's, that's his conflict. So by becoming God, what he's really doing is demoting God and saying that I can become you and therefore, you know, I can equal you. The concept of man is the concept of Adam. Who is the boss, ultimately? Anybody else? Yeah. Adam. Uh, I want to tell you something. Are you asking why we hate them or why God hates them? No, you said God hates them. Yeah. Well, 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 it says also God hates Esau. God doesn't hate Esau. You hear the difference. 
A racist is somebody who hates somebody because of who you are. God can hate somebody because of what you do. That's the difference. Wait, 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 let me just finish. God is not a racist. Remember, racism is, I hate you because of who you are. You know, if you're, if you're black, I hate blacks. What do you mean? I'm black. What do you want from me? Right? I didn't do anything. No, I hate blacks. Right? That's racism. Because of who you are. But if you're a guy that goes and kills people, I don't hate you because of who you are. I hate you because of what you do. You're killing everybody. You see? That's the incredible difference. God doesn't hate all because of who they are. It's what they do. That they want to destroy and commit suicide because they want to, use, they want to overthrow his sovereignty. That's a tremendous. Don't confuse racism with behavior. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you the, Rav, the Rav introduced the being the sheer start of Hanachas from psychology. Who? Yes. Because I wanted to say... Well, that's what... Yeah, yeah. Can we also find these things in the Torah <coughs> as well? In the Torah? Yeah. About what? That is self-preservation. That, that what drives us is self-preservation. Yeah. Self we actually find it. Yeah. Excellent. I agree. Want to know where? I know. Sure. I wasn't going to push you. You want to know what the question was? You want to repeat the question? He wants to know. I, I mentioned sort of fundamental psychological drives, so, and the, 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 the most fundamental in terms of what we do is the, is the drive to uh, to remove inferiority, self worth. The drive to achieve self worth is the fund, most fundamental drive. Below that is self preservation. But I'm not going to that. Just to say, animals have that drive too. But notice, an animal doesn't have self worth. An animal's not concerned with its work. Notice? Right. Tigers don't have problems. That's why tig tigers never go to a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen a tiger that was a therapist. You see? Because tigers don't have any problems with self-worth. But you know what they do have problems with? Self-preservation. Territorial. That's why if you Muslim on their territory, they will kill you. Not because they, not because they have to prove they're somebody. They are somebody. Why? Right? It's because you're taking away their food. That's the difference between an animal and a man. Only a man has problems with his worth. Animals don't have that problem. I ask the same question. How is it about English night for his rugby classes on tomorrow? I give a class in my house Monday morning from 10.30 to 12 in learning how to significantly improve your ability to learn. Like so can't you invite it to an open chair? It's 10.30 in my house from 10.30 to 12 Monday morning uh, I live in Rehobrashi, 91. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I'm glad that in the end you mentioned Islam. Islam, yes. I'm so surprised that you didn't uh, mention them in all the different religions. Religions. <laughs> and I'm also so surprised why we are so tolerant towards them in claiming that their God is the same as our God. Who said that? Well, I hear all the time that Allah is, 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 God? is God? No. I That's a tremendous mistake people make. You know why? Right. You know what the history, history of that is? Well, the Arabs, before Muhammad came along, what, what religion did the Arabs have? They had polytheism. They believed in many gods. Different spirits and so on. Right? The most powerful of all the little gods was a god called Allah. You know that? But it was part of the pantheon of, of the deities that Arabs worship. So along came Muhammad, and he said, wait a minute, you know, forget about everybody else, I'm going to take Allah, who is the most powerful of every word, you know, you know, and I'm going to elevate him to be the supreme. So Allah really, it's, it's, most people are not aware of that, <coughs> Allah is the supreme being uh, among all the other gods, you see, and that's what he really did. And so on. And then obviously what he obviously tried to do is try to legitimatize that. So therefore he, he had, a, if I remember correctly, he had a servant called Ibrahim, Abraham, who taught him Torah in that sense. You know, yes. And that's why he, you know, Islam is the outgrowth of Torah. I mean, look at the five, uh, five principles, five uh, tenets of uh, pillar, pillars of, of Islam. It's all dinam. You know, it's either like, uh, Kapora, Emuna, Ali, or the Rego. You have to go to Mecca once in your life. That's what it is. Why is it considered one of the Why is it not because, because in the present day form, they believe in one God. They don't believe in any of the others. What, what, what happened did is he elevated that one. Again, Islam is monotheistic. That's all it is. Monotheism simply means one God. 
But it's not the Jewish God. I mean, if you look at their God, what kind of God is it? The God that says you need to kill an infidel? Judaism doesn't say that. You, you want to... Judaism doesn't care if you don't believe in God. Nobody kills anybody. Do what you want. It's your bechir, it's your free will. Yeah, if you're going to interfere with my ability, that's different. You see, Amalek wanted to kill the Jews. That's a different story. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But other than that, hey, you can do whatever you want. It's a free country. Or I should say free will. Islam <coughs> doesn't allow that. The problem with Islam, and that's why there will never be peace. Anybody who thinks there will be peace with Islam is an absolute idiot. Why? Because, I, I'll tell you why. <coughs> because the problem with Islam is that they are theologically driven. They can't allow peace. The only way, relate, the only way you can relate to Islam is one of two ways. Either they are under you or they're over you. There is no such thing as equality. You see. And why? Because they are theologically driven. The Quran does not allow them uh, to, it, it allows them to others to exist. But if you do exist, you've got to be a demi. A demi means a subservient person. There's no such thing as equality. A Jew, hey, you can be equal to me. You know, just because you don't believe what I believe, you're equal to me in the sense that you're not, I don't issue laws where I subjugate you, you know, to inferiority. Of course not. That's why it, it's impossible for Islam to make peace with Israel. It's, in fact, Islam cannot make peace with anybody. Because the theology denies equality. That's the concept of jihad. Jihad means you need to rule. That's it. We have no other option. What? Are they in the same line as Amalek or not? No. No, not really. It's just a strategy. What they did is they gave over to their God, right, murderous uh, intentions, that's all. They want to murder, fine. So they, they, their God says to murder. No problem. The Christians did it also, in a certain sense. You know? That's why they murdered so many Jews. Anyway. Yeah. I have a two-sided question. Who? Like, I have a two-sided question. Two-sided? Yeah. Sounds like a double-edged sword. Sounds like a double-edged sword. Double this may relate to the last thing that the Lord just made. Yeah. Uh, there is a measure that talks about the idea that they were so, so much hate towards Israel when we were coming out of Egypt, coming into the land, that it was like a, uh, we were like a, a hot tub, and they were a cold drop. Of yes. To come in. That refers to, what, the, no, that's something else. Let me just finish this off. Okay. And uh, not all, not all uh, terrorists are, not all, just to say, not all Muslims are terrorists, but those that are, yeah. are, are Muslims. Yes. So there's a kind of suicide, suicide bombers. The yeah. concept of the suicide bomber reminds me of this drop of water going into the bathtub to call itself off. It's going to die, it's going to die out. Yeah, it's going to be burned to death. So I do see some kind of a... I oh yeah, the question is, is, oh, is, is it true that uh, Amalek Malay transmigrated the difference? Yes. The Zoya says, which is really very interesting, there's a Zoya that says that Amalek will ultimately merge with Ishmael. Yeah. Now, what does Ishmael do? Suicide. Isn't that interesting? So does Amalek. It's a Zoya. Okay, here you go. Right? Great. Yeah, that. What's the answer of Judaism's uh, way of explaining the person has basic uh, problem with self esteem? How does Judaism interact with the psychology of the person having five You mean what does Judaism do about your need for self esteem? Is that what you're asking? Well, what's interesting about Judaism is it's a paradox. The greater bitl hayesh, the greater negation of self you have, the greater you are. Which is interesting. So your self-worth comes from negation of self. What is that called? You know what it's called? What's the greatest of all madrevis of a Jew? And the answer is humility. Incredibly humble. Yet that was his, that, that's what made him so great. He was the greatest humble man, and then he was the greatest Jew, you see. But that's a paradox. And the answer to that is your self-worth doesn't become, doesn't come because you are searching for ways to feel like somebody. The real self-worth comes from the greatest humility. And therefore, you're worth the most. It's a paradox. You see? So, in a certain sense, <coughs> you know, in a certain sense, 
you actually, by negating, not self, you can't negate self, but by negating your importance or self, you actually become the greatest. You know, they tell the story of Rabbi Akiva Ega. You know, Rabbi Akiva Ega was a, for those who know Rabbi Akiva Ega, one of the incredible gods. So they said, to they one, some guy once said to him, you know, there's a, Rabbi Akiva was a tremendous honor, whatever, and so on. Anyway, he said, you know, by the way, there's an incredible honor that lives in this village. Homo person. You know? So, uh, they told this Rabbi Akiva, so Rabbi Akiva said, I gotta see this guy. I, I gotta see what a guy who's an incredible honor. So he went to the village, and of course, Rabbi Akiva Ega, the village, you know, uh, they honored him, saying, well, what would you like, you know? Well, I want to visit this guy. Let me his name. His name is Ruve, right? I want to visit Ruve, you know? And he, all of a sudden, he goes to Ruve's house, and he says, I'd like to stay with you for two weeks. And he stays with him for two weeks, right? And he sees it's true. This Ruve, he's incredible. His humility is awesome. So he, he's about to leave after two weeks. And he says to Ruve, he says, you know, uh, what I saw about you is just incredible. But I have one problem, one question. It says, you know, each Moshe or your honor be called Oretz. The man Moses was the most humble man. <coughs> Yet I see that you rival him. So the guy said to him, Ruben said to him, you know, I also had that problem. There's <laughs> <laughs> the guy <laughs> You know, it's like the guy, you know, in Europe used to be a Vasa Schlepper. You know, Vasa Schlepper. He's the, you know, they didn't have water like that today, they sink, right? You have to go and buy water, the guy used to, like a milkman, right? The waterman, right? Uh, so, a waterman, what kind of job is that? The Schlepper is that, you know, it's, uh, it's so and so forth, you know? So, um, so a guy once uh, said to me, you know, he's buying some water from the guy, he says, you know, you must feel like, you must feel terrible about yourself, because, I mean, what kind of panos you know, schlepping water and so on, you know? He says, you know, right, I got a real problem, but I want to tell you something. I'm the best water schlepper there is in the city. <laughs> you can always be a bug guy, but in some way, I don't care what it is. You know, because a guy who really is a distortion of self. I, I don't get to guy what that really is in Anivas, but, but the essential idea is, to answer your question, <clears throat> Judaism, the value that Judaism places on a person, which is real value, okay, is the greatest honor. It's a paradox. So by being a nobody, so to speak, or recognizing, not that you're a nobody, you're not. You are with whatever God made you. You see, but by recognizing who you are, right, as really insignificant, that itself gives you the greatest value of all. And therefore God will attach himself to you, Dvekas. The greater the Anibus, the greater the Dvekas. Okay? I mean, there's a lot more to talk, but that's basically it. Yes? <coughs> what was that? Uh, would you like me to comment on the story of the Tanoa of Rabbi Eliezer, where uh, the strategy that the Hakarim voted against God, so to speak, on the Hanafic ruling of the Tanoa of Rabbi Eliezer? Oh, you mean the Imbobin Tia? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> maybe you've done the story to the, to the crowd, and, and it turns out the strategy because there's the, the, the Hakamim of, of, uh, of the Tanoa, they voted against the Yeah. Right. In terms of the strategy, so it's because of the location of the patient. <laughs> But no, no, uh, uh, <coughs> these are Tanoim. Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua are Tanoim. There was a dispute about an oven. The Gemara brings it down. There's a dispute about, about an oven, if it's Tomei, can become Tomei, or whatever. Can it become Tomei to or whatever, right? There's a whole dispute between the great Rabbi Eliezer ben Ruknus. He's a Rabbi of Rabbi Akiva. Phenomenal person. And then there's Rabbi Yeshua ben Chalanya. I mean, these are incredible people, right? So there's an argument, right? So each one wants to prove that they were right, you know? So, uh, so Rabbi Yehuda said, if I'm right, let that wall bend. And it bent. It's a net, it's a miracle. But they were so great that God listened to them. So it bent. So they said to Rabbi Yehuda, I'm sorry. You cannot, God cannot give you proof you're right. Because once the Torah was given, then we're the only ones that can agree what's the right cause. God gave it to man's dominion. What halacha they accept. God can no longer say, I agree with Rebbe Yezah. And so on. <coughs> but that's because God gave permission from, God gave the authority of the ultimate halacha to the chachonim. Uh, so it's not because they think they're great. They have the legal right to decide and God cannot mix in. 
Why? Because he doesn't, he, can't, he doesn't want to mix in. You see, he created, he gave a din that it's a Sanhedrin or a Chachamim. They decide the law. I will no longer decide the law. It was the Torah was given once at Sinai. And after that, that's what they mean by Torah Lapa Shemayimi. Torah is not in heaven. What does that mean? It came from heaven. But once it was given, then God gave you authority, transferred the authority. Who decides what the Halach is? It's the Chachamim, not me. And they have their right. That's why you have Chachamim. The Gemara is filled with fights. Machlekes. Because that's the, that's the way Jewish law operates. It is the Chachamim, man that determines the law. God doesn't determine, but God wants man to use the rules of decision making that he does. You know, there's all kinds of rules how he decides on, but the decision of what the halacha is that. But I don't do with humility. They were they they were tanoim. They were felt they're nobodies. They, I mean, themselves they were incredible. But they had incredible anivas. But they knew that they had the authority, so they can use it. You know, look, Moshe Rabbeinu with Korach, uh, right? Korach, what way? What did you serve the authority, Moshe Rabbeinu? So what did Moshe Rabbeinu said? <coughs> you know, he said, Hey, what are you doing? You only have enough. You know, let's make a test. I thought Moshe was an honor. Why did you define Korach? You see. And had nothing to do with Anivas. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu knew who he was, but he had to defy Kerak because Kerak was creating an incredible danger to Kai's world. He was questioning the transmission process that maybe Moshe Rabbeinu issued laws that were his own laws and not from God. You see, you know why the earth swallowed them up? Why the earth? What kind of but That's a bizarre punishment, that Kerak. Right? Incredible. And, you know, and the earthquake followed him. I mean, it's like, you know, even seismologists, oh, guys who study earthquakes, would stand in wonder at what happened. Right? The earthquake followed Kirach and all the other 250 guys that died. And it was, a, it was incredible. It wasn't an earthquake, you know? It was a local earthquake that followed these guys. Why did God kill them that way? For whatever he did to them. Right? And the answer is, because if you break the authority of Moshe, then the whole Judaism has, doesn't stand on any ground. So measure for measure, since you are trying to make a crack in the ground of Judaism, the ground will kill you. Mm. What? Yeah. Yeah, okay, but well, that's... I'm, I'm just giving you a... Look, you know, and so on. I mean, when they, when they had to be... Men, they had to be men, I mean, but they realized who they were, they're nobodies, but they granted the authority to decide the law, and they used it. Even if they felt like nobody, tremendous anivas. Not a contradiction. Yes? I think when you asked the question just in the previous, uh, the question is really, is, is it possible to have a direct experience of what God requires, other than going through tradition? <laughs> I'm not clear what you mean by experience. Well, people learn Torahs, so the Torah is the will of God. The Torah is transmitted, but it's a document that reveals His will. And, and right? Does anybody have a direct experience of what the divine, sort of divine will is? Yes, by sure being. Right? God reveals it directly. That's through somebody else. That's called a prophetic experience. A prophet has a direct experience. You see? There, there, there's a whole concept called prophecy. It's a phenomenon. Right? Somebody, the concept of prophecy is to experience God directly. No documents. It's a direct transmission. And there were thousands of prophets in the days of old, right? Can I experience such a... Can you? Yes. Voices coming out all the time. Can I experience direct transmission from God? Yes, you can. And I will tell you something. There are different levels or degrees of prophecy. The original prophecy, I'm not going to go into the differences, you cannot experience for reasons. However, there are lower levels of prophecy. The lowest level is called Ruach HaKodesh. You can with the Divine Spirit. Uh, there are people who have Ruach HaKodesh, which means that all of a sudden they know. It's not the same as prophecy, it's a difference. But it is to experience the will of God instantly it arises in your mind and you, all of a sudden you know that you can experience but in order to experience that 
you need to observe the Torah. Because the bitches clear you out and they raise you in the Shema to have that experience. So you can do it. If you, if you really work at it, you can get Ruch HaKodesh. Yes. It'll take a while. But you can do it, yeah. That's available to everybody today. Ruch HaKodesh. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Comment or not really question. <coughs> we also mentioned that this shiur was in commemoration of Moshe Rabbeinu's Oh yeah, well, yeah. So I just want to mention to the last question. Three cards we mentioned, Parsha Tzavet, that all the prophets, whoever came after Moshe, received the chokva and the with the, the inspiration through the emanation of Moshe. Him. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. That's an aside. But to connect Moshe Rabbeinu's Yorzeit, because today was Zion Adol, right? And this year is the last thing I mentioned. The Torah praises Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Kashet Tzivu Hashem is Moshe, as God commanded Moses. That is the exact opposite of what Amalek did. So there you are. That's the connection. Moshe was the antithesis of Amalek. Whatever he did was an absolute uh, 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 observance of what God wanted. Amalek is the compromised God. So Moshe Rabbeinu really and Amalek are exactly antithetical. So that is the next one. Is that probably the purpose of why Hashem has to introduce Amalek? To see the opposite parallel for us to learn at from it? It seems like Amalek has free will. God didn't force them to do what they did. No, but, uh, yeah. uh, as Hashem has created the Torah in love. But here he creates this whole system of generations where, where we have to suffer. Jews have to suffer. Yes. Because it's written. And it's not uh, happening. No. It's written if you don't observe the commandments, you suffer. But it's not written you have to suffer. It is written that you have, you have a job to do. That's true. Although we almost knew that a man is created, he's born to work, a milus. He has to, there's a job and you have to have effort for that job. But you're not born to suffer. Doesn't say that. No, no, I, 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 I wasn't in, 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 fine, I okay. that. That's fine. But like, well, how do you explain the Haman and, and Purim? I don't know what the question is. It's just... Why is there only the in the world? Why are you so always got to suffer from an in the world? <coughs> you know, God, for whatever reason, I'm not, that's another shi of the whole divine plan, but, but the, the essential idea is simple. I mean, there's a, there's a divine plan, and that plan entails or demands free will. Once you have free will, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you could serve God or deny God or whatever you want to do, right? And I'm not going to why there has to be free will and so on, but that's why. Many people che- choose to do evil. And if they do evil, that's their prerogative to, uh, to exercise their free will. You know, you know? That's part. God wants there to be free will. <coughs> I'm, I'm not going to why, but once you have the concept of free will, you immediately have the concept that you can go two directions, right? That's, that's why. But, but, but isn't, isn't the, the, the reason for the Jewish people is their own lack of unity? That, 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 that's why we have onus? Oh, no, no. It's because the Jews uh, do sins. It's the sins of the Jews that causes everything. Period. If they didn't sin, the Mashiach would have come a long time ago. Yeah? Yeah? You know, we try to ask these people. And the Jews coming out, somewhere coming out of Egypt, and now the creation of a monarch. Were they somehow involved by some sort of process that allowed that monarch to come forth? Or was it totally free will of the decision by a to do what they did? Well, fundamentally, it is, a, it, it, it is a free will decision. Look, a monarch always had this. It's just that they recognized that the Jewish religion in Egypt was an incredible threat. But they couldn't do it because that meant going up against Egypt. I mean, Egypt would never allow them to kill the Jews because Egypt needed them for slaves. So they had to wait, who knows how many, tens and tens of years, hundreds of years. Because Amalek really is the grandson, if you think about that, is the grandson of Esau. You know what I'm saying? Who knows how many years they had to wait? Um, look, his grandfather was Esau. We know what Esau was. You know? You see, so, I mean, it's, he's not very far from his Zeta, as they say. So, they couldn't attack, they couldn't attack the Jews in Egypt. They had to wait. Oh, 
The opportune time came. The Jews are out of Egypt. Egypt cannot stop them anymore because they're destroyed. Now we can kill the Jews. But they've been plotting this for years. Just, uh, maybe another question. <coughs> yeah. Uh, how did Esau come from Yaakov and uh, from Yitzhak and, and how did he be the son? How do you what? How is he their son? <coughs> how did two Tzadikim have... Uh, I mean, how did the guy with a father like Yitzhak yeah. and a grandfather like Avram, how did the guy turn out like this? Yeah. Is that what you question? <laughs> and his grandson is a mother because his son was a Lipaz. Right? And I'll even have a mole. Right? I want a yichas. Right? So your question is, how in the world did this happen? And the answer is, the one answer. So, I just can tell you one drop of the answer. First of all, the answer, at least minimally, is that you all have free will. Okay? But the real answer is you have to know who Asa really was. And I'll ask you only one question. And that will bring up the real idea. It's a long shear, you know. But who is Esav? Um, how many of us are there? I vote are there. Three. How many? Three. How many Imahot are there? Four. Do you ever wonder why? Why is it? Is Avram Yitzhak Nyakov? Right? And on the other side, you got Sora, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Hey, what happened here? There's something uneven here. And the answer is, what's the answer? Because, no, well, that we know. No, wait, because, yes, yeah, she was supposed to marry him. But, uh, but his question is, how in the world did Asaph turn out? Because the answer is, there are really four of us, not three. Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Asaph. Asaph was an of. <coughs> you see, the gematri of Asaph is twice Yaakov with Avav. And they, they both had two different jobs. That's why they were twins. Because they both had almost identical jobs. <clears throat> but Asa was an Av. But Asa is a story of an Av that failed. Because it happened to anybody. Listen, there are, there are, there are Russian sheep out there and their sons are fried. You know? Uh, but the real concept is, is that Asa was an Av. In fact, had he done his job, there's a, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> Asaph would have been twice as great as Yaakov of Edo, had Asaph done his job. But Asaph had free will, and he failed. At 15 years old, he failed. But he had incredible potential. He had no idea. I'll give, actually, I can give you one idea to show you how great Asaph was, had he been religious. Right? And it's really in line with this year that I'm going to end with this idea. Okay? <clears throat> Esav was an incredible bug diver. But he was Esav as Abichera. And Esav despised the, bir- bir- the bir- birthright. Yes? He despised it. The Torah tells us, that kind of business is gaiva. How do you despise a birthright when that's your claim to f- spirituality? Because the firstborn was a claim in those days. Okay. So it was when it's gaiva. Let me ask something. <clears throat> What is the most, for somebody who's arrogant, what is the most difficult thing that he can do? You know what it is? Listen to authority. An arrogant person cannot listen to authority because who are you to tell me what to do? Do you know who I am? Right? Got that? Yet we find that Esau, he went off. But Esau did observe one mitzvah. What was that mitzvah? What is Kibra Vayim? Authority. But the incredible thing is that Omar Rabban Shimon Amriel, great man in the Talmud, Rabban Shimon Amriel says that, he says on himself, I am the greatest man in my generation in honoring my father and mother. What I'm going to yell, that uh, he, I, I'm, I'm it. I did the greatest observance of that mitzvah. <coughs> yet, and this is what he said in the Gemara, yet I find Asaph my uncle Esau, the set the Esau because him, right? The uncle Esau was greater than me. In what way? When Esau went in to see Yitzchak, he took off his regular clothing and put on his Shabbos to go to him, to visit his father. Who does that? Today everybody says, hey dad, get up because I want to sit down. 
right? Yet Esau had such kibbutz of aim that he would change his garments before he'd even go to see his father. His kibbutz was awesome. But how can that be? Because Esau was an incredible megalomaniac. Yet the mitzvah he observed was what? Was the most difficult for a megalomaniac to observe. So what did we see? That if he wanted to, he could have observed the Torah. Because if he did that, I guarantee everything else is downhill. You see? That shows you the power of Esau. But he, he had free will. He decided to throw it out. You know, I, obviously Olim Hazer spoke more to him than Olim Habo. You know, I mean there's a lot more to say, but I'm just giving you something to go home with. Anything else? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Uh,